All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our May 3D Experience User Group. Uh, we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. I uh, just wanted to do a quick sound check and maybe a screen check if anyone has a chance to uh, just chat back a response to, to me. That would be wonderful. And uh, we will get rolling here, as I said, in just a couple of minutes. I don't need my, don't need those. Kicking the boom mic. Ah, rocking the boom mic today. I was going into the office today, so I usually have that, that big sure mic in front of me, and I was like, okay, can't can't rock that today. Didn't want to even have to carry it. All right, we got a response from Jeremy. Sound is coming through well on his end, so thank you for that, Jeremy. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. Good deal. So I'm excited to be here. This is my first uh, 3D experience user group. What? Well, welcome. You guys are, are hosting this. I, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, I normally listen in on them, but this is my first one that, that I've actually presented for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think this is my fourth or fifth I presented at. Oh, so veteran. I've presented at a couple. Yeah, we what had a few last year. Presented on. Say again. What are some of the topics that you presented on in the past? Um, let's see. Change action. What's new in certain FDOs? Um, we've gone through um, issue management. We've gone through. Let's see. There's a few other two, ones we've gone through. We did just a general overview of some of the X apps. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, Cool. Just, just dabbling a little bit here and there. Um, I think we we probably got some more X apps coming here in the future. We might do some some X highlight and some X studio when when we get to a certain point with those. We generally try to include a celebrity presenter. That's you, Jay Jordan. <laughs> yes. <That's>, oh boy. <laughs> well, that is a, a nice segue. To, uh, to start the meeting, guys, thanks uh, again for attending. We've got uh, people rolling in here, but it is top of the hour, so uh, let's be respectful of time if we can. Um, we have uh, three presenters today, and so uh, myself, Brian Real, I'm just going to be hosting uh, kind of the, the man behind the scenes, but our first presenter uh, is going to be uh, Mr. Bob McGoy and Mr. Keith Schaefer. Uh, they're going to be talking about uh, a new function or a new feature uh, that uh, is, is rolling out for 3D Experience Exchange for SolidWorks. Um, and I won't share any more. I'll, I'll keep the secret hidden. They can uh, go into more detail on that. And then uh, about 25 minutes into that presentation, we'll pull the plug and we'll let uh, Mr. Jordan Taddeck uh, take over for the second part of the presentation. Uh, and he'll be showing us some really cool things with 3D Sculptor uh, and, uh, and using that uh, particular app on the platform as well. So without taking any more of my uh, my rambling, I'll let uh, Mr. Bob and Keith take over. Uh, it's all yours, guys. Thanks, okay. Brian. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera off because you guys don't need to see my ugly mug anymore. <laughs> so let's go ahead and stop that sharing so we can get down to brass tacks. Um, Schaefer, Brian, can we, can we see our first title slide there? Uh, yeah, but it's, I'm only seeing a portion of it. It's zoomed in too far. Oh, it's zoomed in. Oh, never mind. That's my, all my of it. fault. It's on my end. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Stop, stop hitting that Windows Plus button, Keith. <laughs> so That happens as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you some glasses later. So, so Keith and I have uh, been with CATI for quite some time. Keith and I have been with the company off and on for what is it? Last 20 years, Keith? Yeah. I mean, you, you took it took a little bit time. of a, a little bit of a change for a while, but came right back. But um, we've we've spent a lot of time lately in the 3D experience, and we wanted to share with you a new tool that just came out in FDO two of 2022X of the platform. So, Keith, you want to uh, allude a little bit more to this tool here? Yeah, and let's expand on this. You, you guys may have seen this tool. You may have seen it in some of the What's News um, 
but it really was something that was, in my opinion, a little bit glossed over. Um, and even after the the what's new presentations came out, I was still getting customers coming to me saying, "Hey, how do I how do I accomplish this? How do I you know get data out to a supplier and back into the platform?" Um, and, and this is it. I mean, this is this is without a doubt the best way that we've seen to do so. Um, now, the kicker here is that once that data is in the platform. Uh, the issue has always been getting it out of the platform and back in. We always told all of our customers, hey, once you get it in the platform, it's in the platform, leave it in the platform. Um, and I, I would say that you don't want to, you know, take a lot of time where you're popping stuff in and out. Uh, but in a scenario where you have a, a supplier you're working with, uh, someone you're collaborating with, um, or, and I'm not, I'm going to kind of throw this out there. Um, Jordan may not agree with me, so bear with me, Jordan. Um, but it's a really good way to. It's kind of a better, better option to pack and go, right? It's it's a really good way to just get all of the files that you're looking for associated with one assembly um, out of the platform. Um, yeah. So it kind of it kind of fills a gap in that regards as well. I wouldn't dispute that. I think you're right on. And so, one of the nice things about that is it doesn't cost any more dollars for you or the end users that are gonna be consuming that file. Yes. That download is free. Yes. So, so, so let's with, talk about that a little bit, Bob, because, yeah. um, and I think we'll talk about it, we'll, we'll cover it again at the end, but I wanna throw out here that um, the pieces that you're gonna to see today, um, obviously in, in uh, SOLIDWORKS 2022 SP2 um, and the latest version of the platform, uh, this is already baked in there, but if you're any uh, any version before that, so and, and this is going to correspond with the the last three major releases of SolidWorks. Um, so it's just like uh, the support schedule for the platform. The platform will support the last three major releases of SolidWorks. Um, this will as well, but because it wasn't baked in. There is a, uh, a download that you can go and get from the SOLIDWORKS website. It's free. You can see the URL on the screen there. Uh, you can download this piece that, that does this data exchange. And we'll show you exactly you know, which one is the, the portion of this that works from the platform and which one is the piece that your supplier or whoever the external user is going to need to go get. So to reiterate this from a, another point of view is this tool, this this 3D experience data exchange tool is an add-in for SOLIDWORKS. So anybody who goes and upgrades to SP2 of 2022, this is already an add-in in the download. It's automatically part of your installation. Anybody before that, any service pack from 2020, 2021, and 2022 that is not SP2, you need to go download this free add-in for SOLIDWORKS. Perfect. So, Keith, do we just want to get in and basically show them what the UI looks like for this? Yeah, let's let's jump into this. Um, and I'm going to take this. You know, we're going to tag team this a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this from a uh, perspective of uh, someone who's already on the platform. Uh, in my case, I'm going to be using Desktop SolidWorks with UES, but uh, 3D Experience SolidWorks or SolidWorks Connected, as some refer to it, uh, that that is without a doubt um, an option as well. It works inside of that. Uh, but again, I'm going to kind of roll through this. Um, we've we've recorded this uh, video, or we have the recorded video. And <laughs> when I said that I wanted to uh, actually bump another topic out of this user group, uh, they 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 said they wanted to go video because I think it's because I talk a lot, and they were scared that I was going to run over on time. Yeah, uh, I wanted I wanted to keep you on time, Schaefer. I that's that's my fault. <laughs> it's not working. You're not into the video yet, so it's not really yep. helpful. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm into it now, here, buddy. So, so here is the, uh, the, the piece that we're working from, and what I want to do is I want to allow Bob, uh, who's going to be outside the platform, to, to work on certain components of this. Now, I, I only want him to work on certain components, but I want to provide him context. So, I'm going to come down here. And I'm going to hit the exchange tool from the tools toolbar on down here. And when I click on that uh, export as a package, uh, it's going to fire up the unified XCAD design, and you're going to see the entire structure and everything by default is read only. 
okay? So what I can do is I can pick the items either one by one, which ones I want him to be able to edit, um, or I can pick a, a subassembly uh, like this example and then say all of the children of it. Uh, so I, I like can that a lot. All of them. Yeah, so I can grab whatever structures that I'm gonna send to Bob for him to be able to edit or you know my supplier, uh, whoever the case may be, whoever I'm trying to, to work with. Um, and I'm gonna put this into a folder on the disk. It's basically going to package these up. We can hit the little button. We need to give it a package name and it's going to create a package file that is gonna be uh, SLD PKG, okay? So we're go gonna go ahead and create that package file and we're go we'll go ahead and export that out. Now in this case, um, I'm also gonna use 3D Drive. Um, I've shared that drive folder with, with Bob already. Um, so we'll take 3D Drive, we'll send that package file over to the 3D Drive and basically i don't even have to send it right once i put it in a 3d drive uh, my desktop syncs to the cloud um, bob already has access to that to that folder uh, from 3d drive he should have the files on his end now so from my point of view i go onto my desktop and I, this could be just an email in this situation i'm using 3d drive so I go ahead and go in that folder and there's the, the SLD PKG file that Schaefer sent to me. So I come over, here's just right inside the task pane, there is the 3D Experience Exchange tool. I'm gonna import that. I'm gonna tell it where the files are gonna be unzipped and then the file that, are gonna, that I'm gonna unzip basically. So what I mean by unzip, where I'm gonna have my worker working cache while I'm working on this project. And then it's gonna to present to me a list of all the files in the assembly. I can look at that from a top level, parts, assemblies, drawings, and I can see, well, let's go ahead and open that file up. And with that being said, I grab the file, open it up, and with it being opened, I can do different types of filters here. I can go in and say, just show me the top level assemblies. So there's certain things that I can change. I can't change the read only's. I can change the unchanged, so that's stuff I can edit. Once I've done a look at that, I can go in and say, maybe that sub-assembly, see the, the top head where the gear is, I'm gonna do some edits on that. I can turn that filter off. You can see that part right there, that fixed plate, I need to do some edits because this end effector can't attach anything yet. So I'm gonna turn on some features. Magic of television, do some Julia Child there save that out in the right hand side it's already told me hey you modified that file it also notices that if i check the status the assembly that part file is in also is modified so as i'm going through i have a working list of the things i've changed which makes my life easier now i can add delete or um, modify any of the files i have rights to so here this retaining nut, I'm going to put that into the assembly and add that as a reference. So make that in a position just with a quick smart mate there. And we all know and love those things. Hold that alt key, drag it to the location, save the assembly. And at that point, I can see I've added that as a reference to that package. So I'm still working in that, that directory there. At that point, when I'm done, I'm going to export out a package file to deliver back to Keith. And it's showing all the things I modified, all I'm changing, it even says where that was being added. So here I can overwrite the existing file or I can give him one that says update. It really doesn't matter if the file name changes, it's still smart enough to do its work. At that point, I can throw that back in the 3D drive, throw it over to the fence and give it back to Keith. So yeah, 3D Drive makes this really easy because we can just keep updating that folder. In this case, I can jump over. Uh, I'm gonna go to the import package and uh, we're gonna go to the 3D Drive folder and we're gonna find that, that package on disk. So we'll just go ahead and select that, pop it open. Now, can you pause for a second here, Bob? 
Yeah, this, just give me one second. This uh, the thing that I want to show you here is that if I if I have this on my machine, I don't even have to have these files cached. When I say open here, it'll go to the platform and find those files from the platform and cache them locally. So even if I'm not the one that originated the package coming out of the platform, I can be the one that looks at the changes and brings them back in. So go ahead, Bob. So now one of the other things to think about there is if we didn't have this package, you could be at risk of creating a duplicate if it didn't know where the original was linked to. Yeah, and that's that's a really painful part of it right now is that this is going to make sure that it syncs up and merges what's in the platform versus what was in the package. That's that's very important. So there's my modified, there should be one that was added. And even the new one there, uh, when that comes in, it's going to create its own physical product. It's going to give me an A.1 revision. That is a new part within my platform. So that file actually got added to the package I sent over to Keith. Yeah, that was that retaining nut. Yep. So now when I say open here, um, again, it's going to go find those files for me from the platform. Um, it's going to cache them locally. And it's not yet going to pull all of these changes in. So it's just opening it from the platform. Uh, if I flip back to my session, what you'll see is the icons there. Notice these ones are, are kind of translucent. Uh, they don't, they're not solid. I'll zoom uh, in so for you, Keith. Look at those. Um, these are items that were changed in the package that aren't yet shown in my SOLIDWORKS session. Okay, so these are the changes that I want to go through and typically I'm probably going to want to go through these one by one and say I do or don't want these changes just by right clicking on them and saying replace from the package. Again, I can take them all at once if I if I know what's going on here or I can take them one at a time and just kind of roll up those changes uh, as it as it comes forward. Notice so that the file ahead. change on the, on the left hand side. So the original one was in there without the cuts I had in there. And as soon as I said, as soon as Keith said replaced by package, it transferred the new edits into the live assembly. Sorry, Keith. So, so yeah, I, I get to see all of the edits one at a time. And but you'll notice that, and I want to kind of call this out, they're still coming in at, at revision A.1. And so since this is in work and I have right access to this. I could technically save right over the top of these and call them A.1, okay? What I think is really cool is my ability to come back on this assembly and say, using that save with options, you're gonna see I can say save with options and I'm gonna fire up uh, the option to add a revision right away. So we'll lock what was modified. Um, we'll look at the, the modified items that was new in FDO2 as well. And in this case, I'll get the option to say, I wanna create new revisions of anything that was modified. And I think that this is another one of those pieces that really sets this apart from a pack and go is my ability to bring it back in, reconcile what's changed. And if I choose, create new revisions so I can actually have that full history back to what it was even before I sent that package out. So. So at this point, we can go back and forth as many times as we want. Um, the, I guess the, the one of the things that I want to throw out there is that uh, from my standpoint and the way that I look at this is as a best practice, if I send Bob a, a package, I probably want to make sure that I'm locking the files to, to me because uh, Bob obviously without the platform can't lock the files. So I wanna lock them to me so that someone else at my company isn't making changes over top of what Bob is doing. Um, so basically we, we still want those files locked um, and it, it doesn't have to be, but it's probably gonna be the best practice going forward. Um, again, the bonus here is number one, the, the collaboration portion, portion of this, the ability to receive a package, make changes to it and send it back to someone with the platform um, doesn't require additional licensing. So you can right. collaborate with that outside person 
without uh, without incurring additional licensing. So, just to reiterate, like I mentioned, if if some people came onto this um, later on, this add-in is part of SOLIDWORKS 2022 SP2. It's it's automatically in there. Anything before. Uh, SP1 and back all the way to 2020, you would have to download them from the SOLIDWORKS um, support page, the free downloads page. And you wanna make sure that you download the correct version for the version of SOLIDWORKS that you have. There will be a separate download for each each year. Um, a couple of future plans for this. Um, currently it doesn't support, support drawings. We'll probably see that in the next couple of FDs and um, more of assembly top level assembly modifications and levels below that. There's some things with that that aren't fully supported, but honestly, I think this is an amazing, great start. So um, definitely something I recommend everybody take a look at and try it out. Yeah, so. I guess the other, the other thing is, is remember that 3D Drive, uh, again, doesn't require license. You have to have a DS Passport, but um, there's not a license required. So you can share 3D drive folders with anyone as long as they have a, a DS passport. They can sign that, they can sign up and get a passport. Yeah. And if, if you don't want to share it via 3D drive, you can simply just put it on FTP site or, F, or, or email it or whatever you want to do. Throw it in the Teams. Because at that point, you're just exchanging one file and back and forth. So it just depends on how you want to go about doing it. So, Brian, did we have any any questions pop over? Um, Bob, no, not at this time. Um, you, you guys have either done a really great job or um, people are just in awe of what they saw and they don't really have a way to ask questions yet. But uh, I think everything came across really, really well. Either that or number three, the dulcet tones of Keith Schaefer put everybody to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that one, but yes, it could have been everything. <laughs> <laughs> or my dulcet tones. There you go. So, so with with that, we we really thank you guys for for being part of this users group. The these things are are fun to share with you guys, getting the technical knowledge out there. Um, Brian, we'll we'll kick it over to you to introduce Jordan, and I, I want to see some some curvy stuff. All right. So uh, yeah, if 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 anyone does have questions, you can still put those through the question box. Uh, you can also chat those and, and we'll try to address them. But I think at this time, I'm going to switch presenters over to Mr. Jordan. Uh, and you should be allowed to do that or at least share your screen now, Jordan. Sounds good. Like come online. Here we go. Let me know when you can see me. Yeah, I can see you just fine. That is. You got it? Yeah, sh sure do. All right. You're loud and clear. Sweet. Um, well, Guys, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I love that you're doing this. Uh, user groups are the best. Uh, I have no PowerPoint because I'm going straight up user, user group uh, style, just like winging this, demoing something. Pulling up a, not the most exciting data set, but I'm hoping that the, the workflow that I'm going to show you is pretty exciting. I'm going to be sharing a bunch of tips and tricks along the way. And the, the common theme between all these tips is the fact that X-Shape can do very precise edits. It's all about how conscious you are of the changes that you're making. A lot of times X-Shape gets a misconception that it's only for freeform stuff. It definitely is for freeform stuff, but a lot of times customers are like, well, we can't use that here. It's too freeform for us. We need to be very precise or very exact with our, our, our geometry. So that is a myth I'm going to try to bust today by showing you um, a, lot of cool, a lot of cool features. So let's get into it. And I'll just uh, be spitting out um, any kind of tip that I can along the way as well that you may or may not be uh, familiar with. But one tip right here is, hey, if you want your initial start shape to be right at the origin, don't place it, don't place that shape in the graphics area with your mouse. Just hit the enter key um, right away and it will pos perfectly position it right at the origin. Now, currently the origin is at the bottom of that face you can hit mid-plane 
and it will place it so that you know the the primary planes bisect that model front top and right um, all the way around but i actually do want this bottom the bottom surfaces to be right on the top plane of this particular part um, and this is where subdivisional modeling gets its name you get to subdivide this digital hunk of clay into as many subdivisions as you want but just like splines, you want as few points as you can get by with because the more points and vertices you have, the more you have to move around and that's more responsibility. So you just want enough because you can always add more or remove some along the way if, if you don't guess right the first time. So I'm gonna place that. And, um, and let's talk a little bit more about the fundamentals of X shape in case anyone out here, you know, I'm, I'm going to be getting into some more advanced topics, but just some basics for someone that hasn't used X shape before. I can select all these bottom faces and perform what's called a crease command, crease edges. And what that's going to do is you'll see all those edges get highlighted in purple and they, I just created a sharp edge and, um, by default, everything has a C2 level of curvature continuity in X shape. That's a really, really big deal because it's happening automatically. And, um, and that's giving you the highest quality curvature for any kind of consumer product design. Um, that's what you'd want. Even something as simple and as boxy as like the old iPhone designs, those things have slight curvature on it. Um, there is not any fillets, continual radius fillets, because a fillet, if, you, uh, if you're not aware, it goes from a flat face to, and it jumps right up to a constant curvature value, and then it skyrockets back down to zero curvature of flat face again. Whereas in X shape, we're doing these nice smooth transitions. And to understand what's happening inside of X shape, what I like to do is I like to show the cage. Um, this is what's controlling the geometry. Uh, this is what's really like controlling the math of the surface that's being created. And I could show both the cage and the final shape at the same time. And if you've ever done a style spline inside of SolidWorks, this is a, it's not the exact same math, but it helps you understand kind of what's going on in the background. Just looking at this 2D profile right here, if I were to draw a style spline, and style spline, for those that don't know in SolidWorks, is you draw um, a bunch of construction lines, and then a, a spline best fits itself to those construction lines. So imagine if I drew this vertical edge right here, and then a horizontal edge, and then another horizontal edge. Um, this is kind of like the curve that you would get. This flat edge is perfectly flat, and then at this point forward, it starts curving down to meet this vertical edge. And the whole curvature, because we don't have this segmented into multiple segments like this one, one edge and two edges, that curvature takes the whole height of the part to flatten out to the uh, this tangent edge, you know, going perfectly vertical in this direction. But then right here we don't have as much leeway because that edge is so short so we have to tighten that curvature to curl perfectly flat before it meets this edge right here so if you understand a style spline in x shape we're doing this all in 3d so instead of control construction edges we're surrounding the model with control faces construction faces if you will and that's what the cage is precisely so We'll come back to that because it's really important to understand later on for some of the more advanced stuff, but that's just a basic understanding of, of what's going on here. The benefit though, oh, and let me show you the reason I initially brought that up is because when you crease the edge, what happens is rather than up at the top where we're doing a nice C2 curvature continuity curve as smooth as possible, the acceleration and deceleration of that curve to get from this flat face to this flat edge down here, um, what we're doing along a purple edge is we're just vacuum forming that nice smooth edge right to this sharp edge, and we're sharpening that up. Why is there a curve right here? Because this edge right here hasn't been creased. So we get to see the nice C2 level of curvature continuity transition across there 
from this sharp edge to that sharp edge. All right, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but that's the math that's happening in the background. Now, one thing um, that uh, you can do in, in X-Shape is, well, three things that you could do. You can translate, you can rotate, and you can scale, all right? About that axis or about that axis. Now, I'm pretty confident in the control Z memory to bring me right back to where I was because these bottom faces are exactly where I want them to be, right at the top plane. And if I were to move them, they'd come off of it and you know I'd have to perform a series of commands to get it perfectly aligned to it. There actually is a, there actually is a shortcut to be able to do that, and I could show you a little later. But um, what I want to do here is I want to scale the height of this entire thing. By default, this little robot manipulator that pops up when I select all the entities, by the way, a keyboard shortcut for that is Control A. Um, it selects all the entities. I can scale. But notice, because the robot pops up right in the middle of all those vertices, the theoretical like center of mass, if you will, it scales with respect to that. So I'm going to Control Z and undo that. Hit Control A to select all again. And a lot of people don't know this because if you if you try to just drag this dot in the center, it like it moves the entire thing at once, and it's actually not safe to do. The better way to do it is to move everything at once on a 2D plane. Because right here, I'm looking at the front view. I could be moving it in the you know perpendicular to screen by a mile and not even realize it if I'm grabbing that little white dot. So instead, just single click that white dot. This is like my biggest tip of the day. Now it's now it's not like highlighted anymore. It's kind of like transparent. That allows you to relocate that robot, that little like manipulator, click it again, it reactivates it. And now I could scale with respect to the bottom and I could just place that, you know, wherever I wherever I want it to be. Now I know these bottom edges are still perfectly aligned to the origin. And by the way, everything modeled in X-Shape is NURB surfaces. So that's the same quality of surfaces, same kind of math behind them that SOLIDWORKS uses. So that means everything I create in X-Shape can be machined in a CNC uh, machine program, or it can be you know, clearly, easily 3D printed. I mean, um, you don't even need that high of uh, surface accuracy to be able to 3D print. But any kind of downstream uh, workflow, including popping in a SOLIDWORKS, shelling it out, adding ribs, and doing all the downstream mechanical design, I could do that there, or I could do it inside of uh, X Design as well. So I want to point that out that if I wanted to, I could start a sketch on that face. It's perfectly flat. It's a it's as high quality of a surface as as you could ever get. All right. Um, now what I want to do is I want to I want to kind of resize this. So I'm going to show a couple of hand sketches here. And uh, this top view is is the shape that I want to make. So I'm going to hit Control A to show this all again. I'll just scale this like outwards a little bit. I'll scale it upwards <clears throat> to kind of match the sketch. And then I'll, I'll grab these corner points. And again, I'm grabbing the webbing here. That means uh, everything's staying um, uh, planar on the bottom faces as I'm moving these things around. Now, what just happened, I didn't have symmetry on. I could turn it on now or I could undo that because it looks cooler. And I'll show you another tip. You can activate symmetry down here, and then it's going to ask you to select a plane, and you could select that plane. Or what's even easier is you could just select the plane, either from the graphics area or the design tree, and right from the context menu, just like SolidWorks, um, the context menu is always filtering this uh, list of tools based on what you've selected. I could select symmetry. It pre-selects that plane so I don't have to go fishing for it anymore and puts that green line right down the center of my model. So now, as I make changes, you know, we'll see that take place across, uh, across both sides of the model. And everything I do on one side will be done on the other. OK, so that's pretty cool. Let me come to the uh, side view here. And I also want to point out that um, you know, 
another way to, to, to add precision to your design is as you're dragging, just take note that these this little ruler pops up. As you're rotating, a little protractor pops up. You could snap to those increments and move the, the points by precise amounts if you so choose. Okay, so you can keep um, you can keep moving those points to that precise dimension. Now, I just kind of eyeballed this overall shape, right? But you also see on this sketch that there's uh, dimensions 200 millimeters by 300 millimeters. And I have no idea if I'm right on there or not. I'm kind of close. But if we want to be super precise, we could activate what's called the bounding box. All right, and I hope this is being recorded because a PowerPoint presentation to like kind of summarize everything that I'm, all the tips I'm covering here, covering here would probably be helpful, but you're just going to have to pause, rewind, and rewatch this if, uh, if I cover something too quickly. But the bounding box is nice because it shows me what that is. So as I'm modeling, as I'm moving surfaces around, notice that the, uh, that bounding box dimension, I'm sorry, uh, the height right here is what I should have been looking at is changing as I move. So I can get it like really close to, to 25 millimeters if I wanted to. Or another way to work is I can click on any one of those dimensions, like say this 300 millimeter dimension, and then click on this button, scale using a bounding box. And what this does is it brings up this dialog box that I can, what I highly recommend is turning non or non-uniform scaling. If you're not concerned about preserving the exact shape, you just want to hit the exact dimensions. And then we can round these all off. So instead of 202, I could just round that down to 200 and tab down and round this over to 300. And you see the model shifting a little bit. I'll, I'll do a big number right here, like 400. So you can see, and it moves exactly to 400 millimeters. So that's a that's a super cool tool, um, and now I know that uh, the the shape and size of my design is exactly fitting in my design envelope constraints. Maybe that that we've defined right at the beginning of the project. Um, I'll hide those sketches because we're just going to play around with this model now. So like I said, it's not the most exciting model. It's super basic, but I wanted to keep it a, a basic model so it's really clear to see you know, all the tiny little tricks and nuances I'm using to make this as smooth and perfect and precise of a model as I possibly can. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, make, a, let's make another change. I'm just going to uh, grab these points right here and move them upwards. And this is something that you might have run into before inside of X-Shape. And notice that, like, right underneath that point, things start to get squashed. In fact, you see like the reflections on those surfaces. You see kind of like a dark shaded region. It's we're, we're just really squishing that and complicating the model right there. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that like right here and we're going to turn on the cage anytime something like that is happening to get a clear understanding of what's happening and really understand um, what's going on with the model. I like to show the cage. So check this out. What we're seeing here is that as what, as what I was moving was this point right here. And I brought it up over the existing point, right? Um, so that is what was causing, if I come up too far over, then we're having, you know, imagine drawing a, a, a style spline again. I'm drawing a line over here, then we're coming down, then we're coming back. It's just a really tight corner radius for that curvature to blend through. Um, so a little tip that I like to follow is I try never to, you know, get these um, like little inversions right here where we're zigzagging. I would rather, if I want this top surface to be a really smooth, free flowing uh, surface, I don't want like a little undercut in the in the cage. So what's a way that I could fix that? I could I could grab this point and kind of move it and kind of eyeball it to, to be kind of towards the center, like and maybe I want that to be like a straight line right there, just to really smooth that that area out. 
but I can never get that to be perfectly linear. So I'm going to move this off uh, a linear path right here. What if I wanted to just connect a straight line between this dot and this dot? Well, the way that I could do that is I can control select in that order. I can control, I can select this point, control select that one, and then my remaining selection could be this point or 10 other points in between these two outermost points. And then from the, the pop-up menu, I get this option, align vertices to each other. And it will do exactly what I want it to do. And it will place that on a continuous straight path. And again, that could have been 10 different vertices in between there. As long as you select the outer two first and then the rest, it will align the rest to those outer two uh, vertices. Now, here's another scenario where what if I wanted to, to move this um, point, but along this path, because I want it to be kind of centered here just to smooth it out, let's say. Um, but currently, uh, one of the problems is, is that if I right click this, you'll see that the robot is always aligned to X, Y, Z. Um, and that's because I want to, you know, limit my translations and my rotations to the primary planes and primary axes, but I could also align this to the selection. So check this out. If I, if I click off of here and then I reselect that, you'll see it, it, it kind of does a different orientation, but it's mostly X, Y, Z right now. So here is, again, is a great use for, if I click this center dot and I just drag and drop this onto an edge, it snaps right to it, I reactivate it, and now look, one of the axes is always gonna be perfectly aligned with that edge, and I could drag along, along it and maintain that linear edge on the cage. Now, in this particular example, maintaining this alignment isn't that important. I'll show you a better example in just a little bit. But we could see that the changes that we've made so far, you know, really smooth geometry up there. And we're not seeing any kind of weird shading that's going on right here at all. Um, and that's because we got rid of that little zigzag portion. But, um, but still, if I, I do, I do want to show something else. And that is, uh, if I if I hit the tools uh, tab inside of XShape, this is something that I do before I finish any model, before I like send it on to the next phase, before I start like uh, adding you know parametric features to it. I'll always come here and fire up the mesh inspection command. And what this is, if this does, this was released a couple of FDs ago. Um, it highlights any faces that have the mesh. And by the mesh, I mean the cage uh, inverting onto itself. So overlapping cage surfaces. That's another bad scenario where you can get kind of like an unpredictable, you know, scenario. Because again, if we're considering this as a two, two point spline, we're going from this point to that point or a 2D spline, I should say. We're going from this point to that point to this point, and then to that point. That's not a healthy path. Um, X shape is still kind enough to go ahead and calculate that for us and, and smooth that all out, but it's not a good practice. The better practice right here would be to, to correct that. So again, here, all I need to do, now that that's been exposed, is I could grab this point and bring it back and then if I were to uh, to run that uh, mesh inspection analysis again, we see no red highlights, which means we've got no problems, which is a good good deal. Now here's a scenario, like look how straight this uh, this line of edges is. But this one, because I just moved it manually, um, has shifted out of position. Well, again, here, I could go from here to Control click that one. And then another shortcut is if I hold down shift now and select this one, it's going to select this one and this one and everything in between. Okay, so now I selected the two outermost first. I selected everything in between and I could do align vertices to each other. And now we're going to get a perfectly straight line across there. You know, this is me being OCD in this 
uh, particular example because it's really no big deal if if this is up here. But I can't stress enough, like simplify your model, simplify your cage, take a look at your cage every once in a while while you're designing, and it will really reveal anything where, you know, any scenarios where you're trying to make the surface do something that, you know, you just really shouldn't be asking it to do because you're just complicating things. So uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to quality check your surfaces. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about, um, oh, aligning faces. So here's another scenario where turning on the cage will just like really simplify understanding what's going on. Um, Cause the cage is always there, it's just hidden and we're working on here, but you would never think of these as three perfectly flat faces that are perfectly perpendicular to the top plane because we're seeing the, the end effect of that C2 curvature blending that's been applied to the final equated uh, surface. This is, this is what's driving that geometry. Now, what if I wanted this face, this face, and this face to all be coplanar? Um, how would I do that? Well, here is, here's one way to do it. And this is the way that I always did and it always frustrated me. I use co align coincident. So just by selecting those, and by the way, does everyone know, um, I hope so, that you can, a uh, really easy selection shortcut that I'm using a lot. If I wanted to select this face and this face and everything in between, I hold down the shift key and I'm going to click on the left half of this face. And let me show you what happens when I click on the right side. I'm going to click that one and then hold down shift and click on the right half of that face and notice the path that it takes. So shift selection is just like any other shift selection. It selects the outer two components and everything in between, faces, points, edges, whatever it might be that you, you're selecting on. But the cool thing is that it takes a path, uh, it determines the path based on if you select on this side of that face or that side of the face. If I select over here, it's going to take the outside path. If I select over here, it's going to take the inside path. Okay, that works with edges too. I'll show you right here. Um, shift select on this side. It selects everything in between right there. And shift select on the right side of that edge and it selects everything on the outside. So that's a really, really helpful, you know, X shape. I could have modeled this entire part in probably it's so simple probably like a minute and a half but <laughs> we're with me narrating everything we're, we're we're taking our time but normally i'm working super fast in x shape and those selection shortcuts are the key to working really really efficiently so in this case i just want to point out that i'm shift selecting the left side of this face to select those three faces really quickly and then from the context toolbar, it's saying, hey, you selected a group of faces. Maybe you want to make them all coincident to each other. And if I do this, here's the behavior. Let's see what happened here. I'm going to control Z and I'm going to hit control Y to redo a few times. I'm going to toggle back and forth. Notice how all three of those faces I selected are shifting, right? Including the first one. So what it does is it considers all faces and averages them all out to find a coplanar uh, solution between them. Now, one time, I'll admit, I, I never would have consciously tried this. I fat fingered this command and selected this one because what I've always wanted to be able to do is define the direction of the alignment and make everything else say coplanar to this face, this initial selection. Now I could do that. So I can select these other two. And <laughs> I found this out by accident. Align collinear is, I mean, who would think collinear with a set of faces? You're just thinking it applies to edges, but it does apply to a face. And if I click it, watch the behavior this time. So if I control Z, and control Y, notice how that first face is staying exactly stationary. And the secondary faces that I selected are aligning to it. So that's huge in, in a bunch of scenarios where you just want to uh, make everything coplanar, but with respect to a specific face, um, you can do that. Now with this edge, I wanna bring it back 
and by default, um, a line of selection is averaging out. Look at what it's doing there. It's pretty hard to see, but this angle and this angle is being averaged out, and that's what this little vector is right here. Um, and and that's not the direction I want to bring it back. I want to bring it back along this face, this edge, because we've already gone through the trouble of of making it um, coplanar, right? So just detach your robot, drag it onto that face, and now I know that this uh, arrow is aligned to that face, and I can bring it back until you know it's almost perfect with the other one. And if I do want to make it perfect, I could just select those two. Selecting this one first, because I know it's uh, perfectly horizontal from the top view, and this one might be off, so I can make those collinear, and it will align this one to that first selection. So now we've got a really nice um, model right here. And uh, if I take a look at it, oh, <laughs> except for the fact that it's not no longer covering the, the components underneath. So I went through all that trouble um, of making these three coplanar. What's the solution for fixing this? Well, selecting these three faces is the same as selecting the three flat faces in the uh, in the cage view, right? Um, so let's let's just do this in the uh, the final view. It's okay to work like this too. Um, and we know that this edge, theoretically, the cage, is um, is perfectly vertical. So I could pick that edge and then uh, align the X, Y, Z if I wanted to, and that puts it right over the top. Or if we want to see that right here, we could do that right here too. I could select those, shift select those, click here to detach it, put it right on that edge. And now what I could do is rotate about that edge until it covers the, the, the geometry, right? And there we have it. Um, again, you could snap to these increments, but in this case, it's we're just trying to get rid of a, a little clearance issue. So that's totally fine. That maintains the coplanar alignment of all those uh, of all those faces, which is great. All right. Um, let's see. Here's a big one: draft analysis. A lot of times when we're modeling inside of uh, X shape we should be concerned about draft because a lot of the shapes that are curvy are going to be injection molded most likely, right? So at any time, even while you're editing the sub D model, you can jump over to the draft analysis uh, button on the tools tab, pick a plane that you want to uh, pick as your, your parting line plane. So that's going to be the top plane and then pick any dimension for your required draft. So if I did something big like five, what this is showing me, the yellow, is anything between zero and five degrees. Um, or if I crank it down to one, it shrinks because there's a smaller surface area that's between zero and one degrees rather than zero and five. Now, the amazing thing about this is uh, I can see these uh, faces and this uh, graphical preview. I'm going to move this down to this bottom edge right here. And if I wanted to, I can, um, oh, let me turn off X, Y, Z and do that one more time. So we're actually aligning to the selection when I drag onto this edge. Come on, there we go. And then I can, I can rotate right here, right about that bottom edge, right? So we're maintaining that bottom edge where that, where this model intersects the, uh, the neutral plane as I make that adjustment. But it's even safer to do that in the um, in the cage view because we could see a little better. I accidentally had this face selected too, and I didn't realize that this one wasn't aligned to the rest of these. So when I was rotating it all, it was actually taking this point and dipping it below the um, the parting line, this nice flat face that I have down at the bottom of my model. So if I wanted to add draft to all these, the true solution, if I wanted to be ultra precise, would be, you know, go ahead and select this face and make sure that they're all collinear, right? So that, um, so that th they're all coplanar. 
And then I could select them all and we could see much more clearly uh, what is happening here as I go ahead and rotate this in. Now, let me show you another trick. Um, I can snap to the little tick marks, but sometimes the tick marks, like in this case, are only five degree increments. And what if I wanted to do an exact three degree rotation? So let me undo that. Let's uh, shift select this all again. And by the way, notice I'm having to continually re relocate this guy. If I wanted to, I could right click and say lock orientation, which is pretty nice. Um, and that will that will lock it to this uh, this alignment along these these faces and if you just single click the webbing right here or this little arc um what i can do is it pops up this rule this protractor and i could click on the zero quantity or, or the zero angle measurement right there and i could key in any value so let's say we wanted to do three degrees I don't know what the heck happened right there. I think I picked the wrong ring. <laughs> Let's do that again. And uh, I'm just going to drag it Jordan, down. While you're setting that up, does that work for the translation as well? It does, yes. Awesome. Yes, it does. Uh, let's make sure I've got this selected right. Right here, yeah, should be. Let's try that again, three degrees. What the heck? There is something really goofy going on. Um, crud. I don't want to like refresh my browser or something like that, but that would that might fix it. I've had this uh, this browser open all day playing around with this model, so it might might be just getting tired, just like you sometimes have to reset SolidWorks. But it should be. <laughs> I promise. I promise you, it should be rotating about this edge in by exactly three degrees when you use that that technique. Something something funky is going on right now, and that makes me nervous about the uh, the rest of the stuff that I want to show you. But let's just uh, let's just imagine I went ahead and did that. Here's another way to do it. Let's let's show you another way. Um, we're we're down to about cool three thing. or four minutes here, Jordan. Too, just to let you almost know. done. Almost done. There's two more things I want to show. Um, so right here, I'm going to select all these edges. Another thing that I could do here is scale all of these edges inwards. But again, remember the initial position of that robot, that little manipulator, on-screen manipulator thing, is always, you know, at the center of all this geometry. So first off, I'm going to unlock the orientation. That's what prevented it from like going X, Y, Z uh, to this. It was maintaining the alignment of this edge, which is why the rotation was off. But I also want this to be centered around this shaft, let's say, right? That's where I want to scale with respect to. I don't want to pull this back edge inwards any further than I need to. So I'm going to click right here. Another keyboard shortcut as you're moving this guy around is if you hold down shift while hovering over like a cylindrical face like this, look at that. It'll just snap right to the center point of that geometry. And I can align X, Y, Z. I can click to reactivate this. Now I know I'm right at the center of that shaft. Here's another keyboard shortcut. Well, first I'll show you the manual way. I could click this dot and then click and drag this dot and I'm going to scale in both the X and the Y direction here. But there's an easier way. Because this is mostly planar, I can hold down the Alt key and drag one of those. And notice how all those little end dots are blue. That's because I'm scaling in all three directions at once. And I could just scale this all inwards until that yellow line goes away, meaning we've met our minimum draft requirement all the way around the entire perimeter of this part. So that's a that's a super simple way. The keyboard shortcut there again was the shift key. Now for the grand finale to wrap this up. I need uh, like a little circular edge up at the top here. And I'm going to select these two faces and subdivide them to add more entities. Why am I doing this? It's because I want this loop right here this outer loop, this kind of like circular loop to stay exactly where it is. And I only want to kind of suck these two faces right up to this circular edge. 
which happens to be a parametrically sketched to a specific dimension edge inside of a, a reference sketch. And I want uh, my geometry to be aligned to it. So I'm going to turn off uh, one little tip is you have to disable symmetry for this command to work. And you have to select uh, the edges and then control select. And by the way, this is a good tip too. Why can I not select this sketch uh, geometry right here? It's because whenever we're in sub D edit mode, when this little bar is at the top of the screen, it prioritizes selecting the sub D geometry. It assumes you're editing the sub D geometry. You want to select the sub D geometry. It prioritizes that over anything else. But you can uh, put on this one, select through subdivision geometry. And then that allows you to select other surrounding geometry. So I can control select this circular edge from the sketch and hit this button align to curve, a little hidden tool that is very cool that allows me to snap that geometry to it. And why are we not seeing the definition that we should? Well, it's because these edges aren't creased. So we're not really seeing exactly how it's aligning everything. We'll see it better if we crease those edges. But man, that's not perfect by any means. Why is that? Well, figure out what's going on. Let's show the cage. Ah, so it's aligning the cage entities to that circular edge. That doesn't always mean the final geometry is going to follow that because it's having to wrap around and maintain C2 curvature continuity the best it can to the surrounding geometry, which takes it off that perfect circular edge that the cage points are on. So how do we get it to work better? I'll show you. I'm going to uh, undo this a couple of times to bring us back to where we were. And I'm just going to select this edge right here and hit insert loops. I'll put a loop, an extra loop right through that entity. And I'll do the same over here. If I had symmetry on still, it, I just would have had to do it on one side. But it's still symmetric because it puts it, it bisects the, the edge perfectly. Now we have a lot more edges. And the other key here is that all the edges are approximately equal length. Because what happens is right after I snap this to the sketch geometry, it maintains the same ratio of the edge. So if you have a real short edge right here, then it's going to be relatively short once it gets aligned to the, the new geometry as well. I, I put in an enhancement request to allow us to equally space all the points around, which would be perfect for a nice perfect circle like, like this scenario is. But uh, here's what we're going to do. We're first going to shift select these and let's crease it before we, uh, we apply this command. And now I think because I have more entities and because the edges are more equally uh, spaced or equal length, I should say, I think it's going to work a little better. So let's check this out. I'm going to click this guy. So I just control click the sketch geometry. I control click that. It does a little like kind of awkward twist. That's because I didn't have uh, symmetry on, but I can shift select these. That, pop that robot pops up right in the middle. I can rotate it kind of close. It doesn't have to be perfect because now at this point, now I've got what I want and let's turn off uh, the draft analysis. Not everything has to be green anymore. Oh, by the way, here's an easier way to exit out draft analysis right up there in the heads up toolbar at the top. Notice I'm like crossing over the symmetry line. If I ever turn symmetry back on, which what's the easiest way to do that? Just picking the plane and selecting symmetry. It will, by definition, have to get rid of the overlap there, which makes it bisect perfectly right down the center. And now we've got ourselves very close to a perfect circle. Because again, the cage, is exactly aligned to all that because they're equally spaced it's very close to a perfect circle but if we wanted to be exact we could still scale it up a little bit more in this direction and scale it a little wider in this direction and play with those a little bit but it gets us very very close to that sketch geometry and probably you know you could definitely get it if you hone those points in a little bit more exactly where they need to be uh, ready for, for manufacturing. So there you have it. A lot of tidbits of information. I hope you learned one to five things, like a little, a handful of, of tips to model more precisely in X shape. And sorry, people, I went, went over two minutes, but that's, 
that should do it for me. Hey, thanks, Jordan. Um, to to all the presenters, uh, Bob, Keith, Jordan, um, great job today. This has been recorded, and we'll have this posted on our YouTube channel here shortly. Uh, thanks to all the attendees. Uh, again, as Jordan said, hopefully everyone learned something. Uh, we will have another meeting next month, and we're hoping to have a customer present as well next month. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, reach out to your salesperson. I think our sales team is going to be reaching out as well to uh, to find a lucky volunteer. And uh, with that, I will wrap up the meeting and wish you all a uh, pleasant rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Brian.